Hi, there we are. Shall I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and thanks for everybody for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the presentations and discussions and I hope you are too. Some of you may know that this event was in initially scheduled to be an in-person seminar in Glasgow last April and like many events we've had to rearrange due to Covid. So thanks to everyone who has re-signed up for this webinar and all the new joiners because it's now enabled around 100 people to register to join today. So a particular thanks to two people you might have just seen, that's Sarah Weekly and Linda Fraser, who are colleagues from Policy Scotland, uh, for all their skills to make this happen. Sarah is the administrator today and will be sharing her screen and also provide further information on everything you hear today at the end of the session and on the Policy Scotland website after the event. So the COVID-19 lockdown and the government response has also shaped the context of our seminar and what we will be talking about today. Some of you might have seen that the Joseph Browntree report on poverty in Scotland notes that by August 2020, the number of individuals in receipt of universal credit in Scotland alone, both in and out of work, had nearly doubled compared to January. So there's now over 470,000 claimants. And the resolution report has recently shown that over 5 million UK families, that's about a quarter of the working age households, are currently either claiming either universal credit or working tax credit. So many of us will be familiar with these issues, either through research and policy or first-hand experiences in our families and communities. So I really hope this event contributes to furthering the, dis the discussions and actions around the future of the welfare state and social security. So the launch of David Etherington's new book provides a great opportunity to bring together a number of people to discuss labour market policies. So we'll start today with David Etherington's presentation and directly following this we'll hear from David Webster, who many of you know is based at Glasgow University and whose work on benefit conditionality many of us have gained from for many years. We've then got a panel and we'll hear reflections and thoughts from Polly Jones, who heads up the Trussell Trust in Scotland and was formerly at the STUC, and Jay Wigan uh, from Edinburgh University, who researches the politics of labour market policy and administration. So it's quite a lineup, and I won't talk for much longer, but there is a final point. We aren't running breakout rooms uh, because sometimes it's nice just to have a cup of tea and listen to the research and data, um, but we do have a question and answer session towards the end. So please do submit your questions as we go along. Sarah can then pick them up and we'll share them with the presenters and panel to discuss in about an hour's time. So over to our first speaker, which is Professor David Etherington from Staffordshire University. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hayley. Uh, I just want to say uh, how touched and, and actually honoured I am to be speaking today. Uh, a big thanks for that. Um, I'll sort of get straight in uh, to just by way of introduction is to, to talk about the aims of the book. Uh, basically, the book aims to plug a gap in our understanding and analysis of the interrelationship between welfare and employment relations. Uh, I, something that I think is really neglected um, in social, social policy, policy debates and academic literature. Uh, and I think the implications of what I'm saying is that you can't have a progressive welfare system without uh, also an inclusive employment relations, and I want to, and I've, which is what the book is really uh, arguing. Uh, come to the next slide, please. Um, okay, well, one of the, one of the um, uh, what I like to do is just uh, talk through the sort of conceptual framework of the book, and uh, and. Um, and lots of people talk about neoliberalism <clears throat> and austerity. But I, <clears throat> I want to be clear in my definition that I see austerity, neoliberalism is an aspect of austerity, or austerity is an aspect of neoliberalism, and it's about class and power. And I think those, those are quite uh, crucial concepts in, in, I think, in the discussion today. Um, and the uh, in 2010, the whole sort of new uh, conservative regime was about actually redistributing wealth, but from the from the poor, uh, the working class to the rich. And it's easy to measure that in terms of uh, data on inequality and poverty. 
and, and as Mark Blythe says, it's uh, it's the price. It's the price for saving the banks. Actually, the price is much greater than what the government is doing at the moment. And we can talk about that in terms of the COVID bailouts. Um, but it's also uh, the banks, what the banks want someone else to pay. Now, central to this, this debate about uh, neoliberalism is about labor disciplining. And it's about actually, uh, it's part of this sort of shifting the relation between capital and labor. And, uh, and what I mean by labor discipline is reducing working class agency within welfare and in relation to employment. And that, that re relates to attacking um, and reducing our bargaining employment rights. And as we've seen, um, and I'm gonna be talk, as we're talking about today, that poverty is, uh, is an outcome of that and is integral, uh, important integral to, to capitalism. Uh, which sort of leads me on to uh, what I think is the key purpose of universal credit and the work first policies. Uh, next um, slide, please. Right, so hopefully this, this is uh, these, these points I'm making uh, about the key features of the austerity neoliberal economic model is um, about deregulation, labor market flexibility, capital mob mobility, global finance, uh, which we need, which we need to look back not just 2008 crisis, but also uh, to the the reforms uh, undertaken by the Thatcher government in in the late 70s. So I think that's that's kind of the baseline to to, to looking at um, the the development of different strands of neoliberalism neoliberalism and austerity. Uh, most of you will be, or some of you will be aware of the um, UN report on, on poverty in the UK. And I think it's a nice quote here, no single prog program embodies the combination of benefit, for benefit reforms uh, and austerity is a universal credit. Um, within welfare reform agenda, this strict to disciplinary um, approach is, uh, is, is completely embodied in universal credit. And, uh, and I don't want to steal David's uh, W's uh, thunder on this. He'll be talking about that in sanctions. Uh, although I, I have to say the, uh, it's not just sanctions, which are measures, mechanism discipline, it's also keeping the benefits low um, at a low level. Uh, and also the all, so, all sorts of conditionality, different forms of conditionality uh, in relation to, work, for example, work-seeking uh, requirements. And uh, last but not least, the other aspect of this austerity neoliberal politics is welfare cuts, and which we've, um, we've seen, again, since the late 1970s. Um, could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Right, uh, and, and as uh, Hayley quite rightly says, uh, uh, um, and in terms of preparing uh, this presentation, I was, uh, and it's also included in, hurriedly, in the last chapter of the book, uh, um, sort of a bit last minute job with policy press in, including updating the post-election, the post-election outcomes, as well as the COVID crisis. Um, so I've been managed to, you know, get together some sort of analysis of that, and um, which is a, which is included in this slide. Basically, um, it's disproportionate austerity disproportionate impacts on different social groups. Um, I think at the beginning of the the COVID crisis, in terms of the lockdown, uh, the women's budget group ca came out with lots of very interesting and important analysis about frontline workers. Many of them. Black and minority ethnic groups, being and and women, immigrants, uh, frontline jobs, low paid, insecure, uh, and what we see is the government policies around um, uh, the response to COVID is embodies austerity. Um, never at any other time can you see how austerity has exposed uh, the U.S. economy and social fabric as. In the COVID crisis, uh, slide the next slide, please. 
Right. And as also Hayley says, in Scotland, um, the, um, there's been a huge, well, nationally in terms of England and Scotland and, and the other nations, uh, there's been a huge sp spike in, uh, the, in the number of people claiming universal credit. Uh, and what we're seeing is uh, an extension of the tax on, on benefits as, as, and other forms of income support as, as a safety net. Uh, what I'd like to do in here is to uh, focus on sort of a case study in the book, which is sort of chapter six, uh, on some work I've, I've just been involved with, um, with Sheffield TUC on Sheffield Needs a Pay Rise, uh, because some of, the, some of the key findings of this research uh, exemplify and illustrate how close the welfare system and the employment relations systems are. <clears throat> The overlap, interlink, um, reciprocate in, uh, in one way or other. The Sheffield Needs a Rate Pay Rise campaign um, set up, established by Sheffield to UC, um, in which uh, myself and a number of other colleagues at different other different universities. Um, I've done a web link in the in the slide, so we could possibly include it in the information. Uh, we were commissioned to, to uh, do the research to support the campaign. And, and some of the key findings of the research was the strong evidence of work welfare cycling. So when, you, so when we interviewed insecure, workers in insecure uh, sectors, uh, or sectors where insecure work predominate, um, a lot of them have just come out of, either come out of the benefit system or still claiming, claiming benefits. Uh, and, uh, and particularly uh, universal credit. Uh, we've seen sort of huge tax on the uh, social protection systems, many people falling through the uh, various um, safety nets established, so-called safety nets established by the government, um, sick pay furlough schemes, uh, and the fact that the universal credit benefits uh, are, are about six of the average living wage. Um, but also uh, how, um, how, in fact, the welfare system, and, I, and I, I'm talking about a very long-term um, process, this has underpinned and reinforced uh, this insecurity. So, what, so a, a term I can use is from, from compulsion to precarity. So those are the kind of issues that are raised in the research. Can the next... Um, uh, so just continuing on the findings of uh, the SNAP, Sheffield Needs a Pay Rise, uh, we've seen how, how much, uh, even prior to the crisis, um, in the interviews, in some of the interviews of policymakers, uh, well, and media, people have talked, people talk about the crisis, but we mean two different crises. Um, one, the crisis of 2008, and one of the points I, I try to emphasise uh, I said before the COVID crisis, the economy and the labour market was all, all, all in crisis anyway. So what you're seeing is uh, an extension and a, a kind of uh, an acceleration and an intensification of the crisis. So it's not just that the crisis just suddenly appeared, as you all probably uh, would agree with that and, and aware. Um, we 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 looked at. All, all sectors, well, most of the sectors as case studies, um, and I hasten to add the, the HE sector, which we found was at the fastest rate of casualization and insecurity. Um, so that's kind of, that was kind of interesting, but just for, just for today, um, we, we did a lot of work interviewing uh, and, in, and recruiting, unionizing uh, people in the fast food industry, um, Got developed close links with the the bakers union, and it's about actually mobilising people in insecure work, uh, insecure work, to either to unionise them or get them linked up to established trade union campaigns uh, and networks. Um, also, there was a, a great awareness that. Uh, when you're talking to benefit claimants, you and you're talking to insecure workers, you, you know it's the it's the you're talking to people 
in the same sort of situation. Uh, and uh, so uh, the Trades Council made a, um, a decision to have the um, universal credit, credit campaign to uh, be linked to the Trades Council, which was quite important. And that's that's a sort of link to my um, to the report that we've just uh, undertaken. It like, says a little bit says a lot more, obviously, about uh, the findings of the SNAP report. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Right. Uh, so, um, sort of, kind of. I'm sorry. I'm kind of rushing, slightly rushing through it. Um, um, I don't want to go over time, but I just want to. So basically what I'm doing is trying to kind of tease out some of the key points uh, in the book. Um, uh, right, this is something I, I was thinking in terms of doing the preparing the preparation, preparing the presentation, I was thinking about, oh, what's the, concept, what's the conceptual links between em employment relations and rights and welfare rights? Um, there's there's not much there's not much written on it actually but um, but I thought I, I thought one way of doing it, one way of doing this is to go through the challenges and go through the um, opportunities and hopefully that kind of uh, will um, sort of illustrate the the points I'm making. Uh, we've got we in the UK the post-war welfare settlement was really basically that the trade unions didn't want to be involved. It was a, a decision actually the trade unions made. Uh, they relied on the Labour Party, their kind of natural ally, so-called, uh, to sort of negotiate around around the welfare system. It's kind of a political process. Whereas in other countries, uh, trade unions f have long established um, links through social dialogue with, you know, the tripartite agreements. Uh, the, the ha there is tripart a history of tripartism in in the in the UK. Um, Particularly, you know, have, it, it, worth having a look at the papers of the Manpower Services Commission. Uh, uh, but there's always tensions about that because of the underlying uh, sort of liberal market approach. So that that's raised that's raised a number of challenges to how trade unions uh, could be involved with the welfare. But the unions, you know, the unions are sort of more or less keen on um, maximising in-work benefits, um, you know, unemployment insurance and so on. And uh, so other aspects of the, the sort of social security, um, they sort of kind of left to uh, the Labour Party and other policies, other pl uh, policy communities and welfare rights and so on. Um, it was really, it's only in the later stage of the new Labour government, you know, the two, the Labour's, new Labour's 2009 uh, welfare reform act, which really shaped uh, a much greater uh, discussion and debate within the trade union movement about the impact of welfare. Although to be fair, the Public and Commercial Services Union, PCS, uh, has been kind of campaigning, you know, since in the 90s, um, Around uh, around welfare reform, so it's not just um, it's not just recently that the trade unions have been uh, involved, but the TUC taking it, but only recently the TUC really getting more involved. Uh, I think 2015 Welfare Reform Act was quite um, quite significant in terms of the shift change around austerity and particularly around the politics of welfare. Uh, and John McDonnell. And I, I heard I was at a Labour Party conference, uh, fringe meeting. Uh, I heard him sort of wrote this down, although he's been well quoted about. I'd rather swim through my own vomit than, than vote for that act. But that I think that was kind of defining moment politically. And uh, next uh, slide, please. So uh, this, this, yeah. So the, the, there's no doubt that there's lots of challenges for trade unions, particularly around dealing with insecure and precarious workers, but it's also important. And I think what I've tried to do in the book is uh, flag up some of the some of the areas of where there's been engagement, solidarities and, and resistance. Um, so I've sort of there's a there's a list of there's a list of initiatives. There's the establishment of the United Community, uh, which I've actually joined. Um, I think that's quite quite significant by uh, Len McCluskey. Uh, that was 2010, I think it got going. I think it's the 10th anniversary of the United Community. And if I was at a United Community meetings today about the 
um, the Commission for Social Security, which is chaired by Michael Orton. Uh, so we've seen um, evidence of trade union engagement with welfare issues. I have to say that that's uh, that's been throughout the previous 30, 40, 50 years, but uh, much more focused around um, current policy, uh, initial policy, government policies. Um, there's there's a lot there's lots of examples in which I'm sort of including the book. For example, the TUC uh, have got a campaign around reasonable adjustments for disability uh, workers. The TUC established um, with, along with the Unite and the Unemployed Workers and DPAC, Disabled People Against Cuts, um, a welfare charter sort of framework for a more just social security system. So uh, there's there's been quite a few issue, few examples of where um, there's sort of grassroots and a national base and regional base organising. Next one, how am I doing for time? <laughs> Hopefully, um, I'm not going to speak over time. Um, right, there's a chapter. I, I have been researching the Scandinavian system, particularly Denmark, for. A long, a long time. Um, uh, I, was, I was used to live in Denmark, speak Danish, and uh, I've always been interested in the Danish model. I've published on Denmark, and um, and I suppose it was kind of fitting that I should uh, include it as a chapter in the book. But uh, but the but a strong reason is that if if you're actually arguing a case for something, um, it's important to actually demonstrate from a case study where some model which is close to what you want where you want to go uh, exists and the danish model is quite interesting in terms of the trade unions involved controlling and employ employee insurance um there's strong um social dialogue between the trade unions uh, and other policy makers um high levels of uh high trade union densities meaning there's about 70 percent people workforces um, are members of the trade unions also uh, some aspects of social policies are uh, negotiated through uh, collective agreements in fact the minimum wage is negotiated through um, by a collective agreement um, it's not a perfect system which also I mentioned this um, you know there are sort of critical aspects and neoliberal uh, threats um, but there's also incredibly uh well compared with the uk quite progressive uh, developments for example some trade unions have uh, been able to uh, coordinate uh, and organize collective agreements for people on in the platform economy and that means people who are actually working for working from home th and employed through through the internet so so that's kind of an interesting dev uh, i think the first collective agreement in the world so you can see um, see the sort of uh, knock-on effects which uh, can are possible for a strong employment relations system. Um, next slide, and I'm, and I'm finishing. Um, right, um, so there's the, the last chapter, the last chapter of the book uh, following the Danish is uh, I'm trying to summarize some of the um, some of the kind of main findings, some of the main arguments and proposals. Um, one, of the thing, one of the things I try to do in the last chapter is a sort of reflection on the current situation uh, and about how, COVID, how the COVID crisis is, is being used to undermine the safety net, attack trade union rights and employment rights and, uh, and, wel and welfare rights. Um, now, what, one possible criticism of the book is, and I'm, I'm kind of sort of aware of it, I'm, I'm, I am critical in the book of the trade unions, but um, to be quite to be quite honest, I'm the, the harshest critic. Um, they drive me mad a lot of times. Uh, but um, the thing is, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to be sort of uh, make a balanced criticism and be reflective be critical about the, the role of the trade unions. What I, I didn't want to give sucker to the right wing um, to attack the trade unions, which you can see, which is going on now. The the, the, the government is going to scrap uh, union learn. 
is proposing to scrap union learn there's already a campaign to save union learn and i've had involvement with union learn in terms of uh, evaluations and policy uh, development and uh, you can see that the agenda is to tack work welfare and employment rights uh, and i don't think there's any any there's always been that connection but i don't think there's any other time when that connection is so interlocking between the employment rights and well and welfare rights and uh, i think this needs to be um i think when when welfare when people write books on social policy they they should write also about the implications on industry relations and vice versa um the other thing I, I do mention in the book, uh, I've got a chapter on uh, Greater Manchester, maybe Andy Burnham's been reading it, <laughs> um, that, you know, one of the key areas of um, the ge ge geography of, of this whole austerity is the, the, the regional uh, and different nat national uh, inequalities that, uh, that, have, that have been emerging uh, again, since the since the nineteen seventies, and um, and we need to sort of look at how these uh, inequalities are being responded to, and I think what's going on in Greater Manchester has been has been quite interesting. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, hopefully, I'm I'm in time. Nobody's uh, I've not been told to shut up, so <laughs> I'll I'll leave it that, and hopefully we'll have time. For, for Dave and David W to come in. That's great, thank you. Um, what I'll do now is I will bring in David Webster and we'll get his slides going. Okay, well, <clears throat> what I have to say fits in neatly uh, within David Etherington's framework. Can we have the next slide, please? So, um, to confirm, sanctions very much are a feature of the neoliberal order. <clears throat> There's been a huge escalation since, since 1986, that's the watershed, in terms of numbers of sanctions, the severity of the penalties, and also the extension to new types of claimant, namely uh, sick and disabled people and carers, uh, most conspicuously lone parents, who previously were not subject to conditionality. And of course, this reflects an enormous uh, change in the way that social security is conceived. So previously, um, since, 19, since the 1911 Act, it was conceived as a collective insurance system which protected people who were in misfortune. Now, the message we get from government is that it is a handout from workers to shirkers. It should only be minimal help because people are undeserving. Behavioural conditions have to be imposed because claimants can't be trusted to pursue their own interests and there's a need to deter claiming at all and people will remember the phrase less eligibility um, from the 1834 poor law act so what we're actually seeing is a considerable return to pre-1911 poor law assumptions not total but considerable next slide please so now, just to show you how the, the numbers of sanctions have changed, this first chart takes you back to 1986. And because it's only unemployed people who were subject to conditionality in 1986, this chart refers to unemployment, unemployed claimants only. And you can see that in spite of a lot of noise during the 1990s under the Tories, there wasn't actually a huge escalation in the numbers of sanctions for active conditions, that's to say the behavioural requirements. That escalation really only began seriously under new labour and then of course was escalated to huge heights under the coalition government 
peaking in 2013, since then there has been a huge fall again to roughly the level of the early days of new labour. Next chart, please. This chart shows you a shorter time scale just since 2001. Now this does bring in all of the types of uh, benefit claimant that are subject to conditionality, JSA, ESA, income support and universal credit. And again, it shows you an enormous peaking in um, the period 2010 to 2014, uh, since when there has been uh, a sharp reduction to, in fact, below the level in 2001. Next chart, please. And this chart again has an even shorter time scale and shows you the individual types of benefit. So you can see that universal credit um, dominates the picture entirely. Um, it started off with a very high level of sanctioning, but um, by uh, the beginning of the COVID epidemic, it, it had actually fallen to uh, a relatively low level by its own standards. You can also see JSA sanctions undergoing um, a considerable fall. The other types of sanctions have never been on the, quite the same scale. Next chart, please. So, sanctions have been de-emphasized numerically. Why has that happened? Um, for a number of reasons. First of all, the intensification of sanctions attracted really massive criticism. Um, we had critical in inquiries, three of them by, House of Com by the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee, by the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly. We had an absolutely devastating report from the National Audit Office in 2016 that showed that ESA sanctions actually reduced the prospects of people getting into work and also that uh, JSA uh, sanctions pushed people into worse jobs than they would have got without the sanctions. Then there have also been numerous voluntary sector reports and perhaps disappointingly for some of our audience, um, academic criticism has played a role, but I don't think it's played a particularly uh, big role. I think it's much more these other uh, kinds of report that have, have undermined um, the uh, government's appetite for sanctions. And of course, the DWP started out without any serious rationale for the escalation of sanctions. This was very much a doctrinaire thing, uh, inspired, for instance, by the Policy Exchange right-wing think tank, uh, Duncan Smith's own uh, ideas, and somebody who hasn't been fingered properly for his involvement is Chris Grayling. Chris Grayling was Minister of Employment at the time when the 2012 Welfare Reform Act was being granted, uh, drafted, and I've been told by, D by people in the DWP that he had a major influence over the sanctions regime. In other words, this was another grailing cock-up to add to the other ones we know about uh, stopping prisoners uh, getting books, um, the criminal courts charge in um, England, which made people, uh, gave people an incentive to plead guilty to charges they weren't guilty of, and which Michael Gove, uh, of all people, swiftly reversed when he became uh, about its sanctions regime. Um, next slide, please. Um, but although the numbers have been reduced, the regime is still doing a lot of damage. Um, first of all, we've got this language appropriate to a penal system, which is embodied in the legislation and in the practice, words like failure, transgression, offence, etc. The system has been redesigned so that claimants get, get threatened with sanctions as soon as they walk through the door. There was a lot of criticism, ironically, this uh, partly due to people who thought that, um, that claimants were suffering from 
having sanctions unexpectedly. So there were various lobbyists who said, oh, you've got to tell people about sanctions first off so that people know what they're facing. But of course, the effect of this has been to turn the whole system into a threatening one. Then we also have the claimant commitment. It's an unequal and unreasonable contract which people have to agree to um, under duress. And we know from survey evidence that claimants themselves think that, it, that the commitments are often not achievable. Then we have the question of, du of the duration of sanctions. The situation has been worsened enormously by the switch from the rule that sanctions, overlapping sanctions, ran concurrently to making them run consecutively. Also, the rule that sanctions should apply until, pe until people comply with whatever condition they're supposed to, which is applied in ESA and in universal credit, that has done an enormous amount of damage because it's often very difficult for claimants to demonstrate compliance, particularly if there are communication difficulties between DWP and contractors. So the result of that is that around 90% of people whose sanction periods have been lasting more than six months have not been helped by Amber Rudd's very modest reform of November 2019 when the maximum stated sanction period was reduced to six months. Another point is that sanctions nowadays for many people mean total destitution. Hardship payments, for no good reason, were turned into loans under the 2012 uh, Act. And that has resulted in the take-up being drastically reduced. So lots of people are having to do without any support whatever. Um, also, there is now no independent adjudication. That was a bright idea of the new Labour government in 1998, who put into law an act that had been drafted by Peter Lilly and Michael Portillo. And that Labour government, Harriet Harman and the others, they put this bill through the House of Commons uh, as, if, as if it embodied their own values. Quite extraordinary. So there's been no independent adjudication since then. And of course, there's also an appeal process which has been made slower and more difficult for in many cases, not, not in every case, by mandatory reconsideration. Next slide, please. So here, these are the sanction periods. So about 14% of universal credit sanction periods are currently longer than three months. That's to say in the uh, period ending at the beginning of the COVID epidemic. Next slide, please. And this shows you what's happened to the proportion of sanctioned claimants receiving hardship payments. So the blue line shows you the proportions of JSA uh, sanctioned claimants who are receiving hardship payments, which is almost half. Uh, and the ESA people, it was almost 20%. That's the brown line. And then the, the red and green lines show you what has happened under full service. We've only got fragmentary information, but you can see that the proportion of sanctioned claimants under UC who get a hardship payment is much lower. Next slide, please. So now I want to run very quickly through these impacts of the punitive regime on claimants. There's lots of evidence for these. Next slide, please. On labor market behavior, here what, what uh, even um, people who are just concerned about the economy ought to be worried about is that there's plenty of evidence that sanctions drive people into worse jobs. They put square claimants into round holes, basically, as well, which is bound to have an impact on productivity. They take the pressure off employers to provide good conditions and prospects. And they also reduce the coverage of state employment support because the way that the state knows that people are unemployed or workless and need help in accessing the labour market is when they claim. So if you drive them off uh, the benefit system, then you don't know about them. Next slide, please. And here's the various evidence about driving people off the system. And then, of course, the other effect 
is that because better off people find the whole system too demeaning and don't use it, and also a lot of young people also don't use the system, often encouraged by their parents who know the way they're likely to get pushed around by the job centre, we're into a vicious circle where the support for social insurance is eroded. Next slide, please. So can we look forward to any reform? Um, one plus factor is that the epidemic has meant an awful lot of people who don't usually claim Social Security having to claim it, and they've been finding out how weak the safety net is, and so we've actually heard quite a lot from them in the media. So that's helped to build support for reform. But on the other hand, because uh, government borrowing has been so huge uh, as a result of the pandemic, there will be strong pressure for fiscal retrenchment after the pandemic is over. So unfortunately, there are counterbalancing forces there. Next slide, please. Um, so other considerations. Government strategy since 2013 appears to have been to get sanctions off the front page, as it were, by reducing the numbers. And that very high level of universal credit sanctions early in the system seems to have been unintentional, uh, a cock up because of the design of the system. Um, they ha do appear to have relaxed conditions now, although they reintroduced sanctions on the 1st of July after the COVID moratorium. Uh, they do seem to have given out instructions that work coaches shouldn't sanction people if they can show a reasonable level of activity. That is not what's actually in the Act, but it's what DWP appear to be telling their staff. We'll find out more about that when we get the next lot of uh, sanction statistics next month. Um, the current Secretary of State has indicated some willingness to consider minor reforms, but she hasn't done anything about it. And of course, one of the uh, important considerations here is that the government has no appetite for primary legislation, which would open a can of worms, be extremely controversial, uh, get loads of negative publicity, and so on. So they don't want to do it. So my conclusion is that the prospects for reform of the system don't appear to be very good, although it is appears likely at the moment that the actual numbers of sanctions will remain relatively low by, by neoliberal historical standards. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you also, David Etherington. Um, we're going to have a panel now. So joining us today, we've got Polly Jones, who heads up the Trussell Trust, um, which for those who don't know, it's the largest network of food banks in the UK and in Scotland. And Polly's got over 20 years experience working in the third sector on campaigns and research to tackle poverty. So hopefully we'll hear some views from Polly about what she thinks about what we've heard today. So I'll hand over to you, Polly, if you're with us. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, and to all the, there are lots of names that I recognise on the screen, if not your faces. So um, looking forward to some of your juicy questions later on for us all. So thanks very much to David and David for their presentations. Um, it's hard not to feel pretty hopeless, isn't it, when you sit back and listen to all of that information about uh, what we've what we've done to a welfare state, something that many years ago was a beacon of. Um, progressive achievement around the world and many other countries were trying to were looking to our welfare system to think about how they could implement something like that and like our national health service um, in their own countries. I think what what really struck me um, was looking at the data for the growth of food banks across the UK and across Scotland and how that really mirrors um, both what David Etherington and David Webster were telling us and sharing with us about um, UK government policies and um, in particular, the kind of role of sanctions. So, you know, before the latest sort of set of austerity policies came in with the coalition government after 2010, 
Um, before then, there were very few food banks set up around the UK. I mean, there, there were some soup kitchens and um, some emergency food providers, but nothing like uh, the network of food banks that we see in existence today. In Scotland, we've got um, about 200 food banks operating, not just in the Trussell Trust Network, but um, independent ones as well. So there's been a massive growth. And over that time, not just a growth in new food banks setting up, but also in the amount of people that those food banks are supporting and the amount of food that um, food banks are giving out. And I think there's a, a couple of things that struck me. One was that, you know, I think it was quite clear that there was a, the, the changes in the welfare system were absolutely intentional, a clear design about who the welfare state was there to support and who it wasn't, and the role of that work should play for those people that weren't to be supported by the, the welfare state anymore. Um, and I can't help but think that it was also intentional that if people were struggling and the welfare state wasn't able to meet their needs, then other groups would have to pick up the pieces and would have to take responsibility. And that, I think, is where part of the part of the sort of actions by individuals in the local community to set up food banks and other initiatives came from. But it's really clear that you know people are struggling not because they haven't got enough food per se, it's because they haven't got enough income in their pockets. And in some ways, the provision of emergency food through a food bank network really mirrors the kind of weakness of the new welfare state that we see too, because we're trying to meet some basic needs, but not really what somebody needs. You know, it's not, it's not food that we should be supporting people with. Um, and I think, I think that in that sense, I can see some real historical links to some of the, some of the things David Webster was touching on that back before 1911 um, and, and while we had the poor laws coming in. I can also see that we've, you know, we, much as we've got so much evidence about what's going wrong with all of, with all of, uh, with the, with the, and who's really losing to return to, I guess, the question of this seminar, missing out with the new welfare system that we have in place. Um, we can see with the current kind of new, new concerns about um, how the economy has been hit by COVID, concerns by different levels of government about their resources to meet people's needs, that we've seen a flurry of activity by all governments, UK, local, Scottish, to meet welfare needs, again, by giving out food rather than by building a better safety net. So one of the initial responses of uh, the Scottish government and of DEFRA for, for um, England and Wales was to purchase food through Fair Share, emergency food through an organisation called Fair Share, and see that distributed to all kinds of emergency providers, um, not uh, trustful food banks actually, but for other, for other emergency providers. Um, and partly that was because, you know, of a kind of instinct that we're told a principle that we mustn't let people go hungry, which of course we mustn't. But it was also because that was a cheaper alternative. It was cheaper to buy emergency food and try and distribute it rather than put money into a social security system. Um, I, uh, I think that another, another thing I just wanted to, I was reflecting on was we've got a huge amount of data through our food bank network around um, who's visiting food banks. And um, we are very much seeing people who, 94% of the people that we support would be classed as destitute. So um, not just a little bit poor, struggling with a few bills, but absolutely brassic and um, struggling to pay rent, put the heat on, buy the kids school shoes, as well as um, missing meals regularly. Um, and probably not having hot meals as well. Um, it's clear from our data too that the reasons people give are because it's low income, often benefit delays and changes to benefits. Um, and in terms of the kind of demographics, it's households obviously with a lower income, particularly younger people, single parents, renters, and people with health conditions. Um, and to put that into context in terms of what that means for the amount of money most people we see have 
have to get by on, usually we're, we're finding that most people have just 50 quid a week after they've paid for their housing costs to cover everything. And for a fifth of the people we see, they haven't had any income at all in the last month. Now, if that doesn't show you that our social security system, our safety net is far from safe, I don't know what does. Um, I think it's also very clear that the people that we see who have, have got so little support around them by the stage that we meet them, they've got lots of complex issues. Three quarters of people have got a health issue or are living with someone who has a health issue. Um, over half of the people that we work with um, are experiencing mental health um, problems or again are living with somebody who does. So it's not it's not um, just an issue of uh, not having enough money to, to buy food or other things, but a real complex set of issues that have got more and more difficult and challenging as that amount of time struggling to get by has gone on for longer. And so when we think about, you know, um, the interrelationship between welfare and work, I think I've, I've learned a lot from actually uh, some research that a PhD student, uh, who, well, she's, she was a PhD student, she's now got her doctorate from the University of Glasgow, um, Dr. Marianne McLeod did on food insecurity in Glasgow and the Go Well study that um, uh, many of you will be, have been familiar with. And I think that, you know, she did a, a, a lot of really interesting work um, for a Scottish project called A Many for Change, which told us a lot more about people's experiences over a period of time of not of, of food, food insecurity and destitution. And so, you know, sometimes when we look at, particularly look at some um, statistics, you think that people are either managing or they're not. But actually what we can see is that it's, it's a very fragile situation. People are in dipping in and out of these different experiences, coping one week, not coping the next, and then out of it. Um, so when we think about the kind of welfare support that we need, or the support from the world of work, it's not as straightforward as, as um, just making sure that someone's got a job or making sure someone's on the right benefit. It's a much, much more support, wraparound support that people are, are look like that they're that they're needing and i think it's been it's been certainly from a kind of um the perspective of food insecurity and food banks it's been much easier for us to focus on what's happening with the social security system maybe than the world of work whereas it seems to me a very basic that the first basic safety net that we would want for everybody is a job that that covers the cost of what you of what you need and if that doesn't work that's what our social security safety net should be there for um one of the things that is really striking, I think, around the implementation of universal credit, where we can see it working um, least well, is how it really doesn't fit with people's experience of work. Most people that we would see, you know, it doesn't fit if you have a zero hours contract. So one, one week you're earning money and the next you're not because of the delay in the system in adjusting to that. And it doesn't fit with short term contracts, which we know are on the increase because because of the delay again in interacting in and out of the welfare system. Um, so I think for those researchers out there, when you're looking at um, what you want to focus on next, I think as David Etherington pointed out, we really do need to interrogate much more closely how welfare and employment interact together because, because they certainly the welfare system as it sits at the moment, they, they, they're not designed to fit together. Um, and I think one of the things that was very striking at the start of the COVID period was from research that the Scottish Trade Union Congress had done was that many people would be entitled to benefits, but they were absolutely not going near the system um, unless, they, unless they had to. They were going to use up whatever savings they'd already got, borrow from friends and family, find other ways to cope to avoid getting involved in the benefit system. Because people... You know, I think one of the maybe the biggest misconceptions for me about the welfare system as it was designed in 2010 by the coalition government was was this idea that people were, you know, shirkers and skivers and slackers because everything, every bit of evidence we've got everywhere else is that actually the people that we meet at food banks and people who are juggling multiple precarious zero hours contracts is that they are some of the best organised, best at budgeting, 
um, people that you come across because they know how to get by with so little and to navigate an increasingly complex world. Um, and that they're very proud, do not want to have to depend on, on, on handouts if they don't have to. Nobody does. So um, I think there's some of the, I guess, some of the bits of information I just wanted to share around what we're seeing on the ground and how that maybe sits around what David and David have both been telling us about. Um, some questions maybe that I'd be keen for us to reflect on. One is um, how we challenge and change this. You know, there's not a lack of evidence about who has been hurt most by changes in the benefit system, but we haven't seen a um, kind of comparable shift in change in that policy. So how, what do we need to do that? Who are the actors? What are the vehicles for change to do, to do that? Um, I think um, I'm also quite interested in um, what, what gaps you think there are what, what don't we know and where do we need to fill these gaps in terms of the interrelationship between welfare and work and particularly around precarious work um, and zero hours contracts. Um, and I guess just as, a, just as a sort of final point, like I said, after hearing those two presentations, it's, it's pretty, um, well, it's a badge of shame really on all of us, isn't it? That this is how we've, how we've let things uh, get to. But one of the things, when I think about reasons for hope, reasons why it's worth challenging this, looking for more evidence and trying to argue that there's a better way of doing it. I've been very encouraged by some of the new um, campaigns through the COVID um, lockdown, where groups of people have started to really speak out about and get active in ways that they haven't done before, particularly young people who we know have missed out a lot through all kinds of different bits of the safety net they've fallen through the whole lot um, and are most likely to be experiencing and working on zero hours contracts for example so I think some of those campaigns and of, of younger activists that give me give me hope as a as an older activist that there's some some energy and some change to come the the other thing that I'm interested in particularly is that organizations like the Trussell Trust which set up set themselves up to support more and more food banks operating across the UK and across Scotland have absolutely reorientated their strategy and are now committed to supporting food banks to, to, to be able to close, to, be, to strengthen the services in their local communities so food banks don't need to exist through a very you know, um, sophisticated strategy of policy campaigns and practical on the ground sort of change in local service provision. So if the Trussell Trust can make that sort of shift, the big tanker, of, of a, you know, a food bank network can make that shift. It gives me quite a lot of encouragement that other organizations are likely to be able to do the same and might be ready to kind of join and move towards the calls for a fundamentally different, stronger, effective safety net. Thanks very much, Polly. Um, it's really interesting to get all your data and all your insight through the Trussell Trust because you really are on the front line of this. Um, I'm gonna bring in Jay now. Jay works at Edinburgh University. He researches uh, labour market policy, public employment and administration, and he's also writing a book which is on um, the politics of unemployment from 1975 to 2020. So um, over to Jay. Um, hi Hayley, uh, thanks very much. And thanks very much uh, David and David for, for a really interesting uh, presentation. I guess for me, when I was listening to the presentation, and uh, I read some of your material, uh, David, the, the book you've recently published, I dipped into that uh, yesterday. I think what really comes through is what we're talking about here is the issue of power, it seems. Um, so we can talk about mending the safety net, but I struggle to see how we're going to do that as long as the people who are currently in charge are necessarily in charge. Um, in a sense, I don't think there is a disjuncture between the current labour market and the social security system. I think uh, from what we've seen, they have, they have certain complementarities and that has been an objective of the initially the coalition government and then uh, the subsequent Conservative administration. I mean, they pretty much set out what they were going to do prior to 2010, got into power, pretty much did it. Um, you know, they're talking about more radical flexibilization of the labor market, 
models of kind of slivers of time working, um, fostering atypical work through the development of universal credit. I mean, these, these types of activities were kind of all articulated. So, and this has been going on, I guess, as a sort of has been alluded to since the late 1970s and uh, David Webster points out 1986 as a key moment in this process with the introduction of the kind of the restart programs. And I guess my, my reading of this is that it's not coincidental that the introduction of restart followed on rapidly after the um, quite substantial defeat of probably the most powerful organized section of the labor movement in the National Union of Mine Workers. Um, and we've had the kind of gradual creep, what uh, Pete Dwyer terms creeping conditionality in social security uh, since then. So I think what I'm interested in, in terms of where we might go from here is perhaps less about what uh, modifications might be made to the uh, safety net or the creation of a slightly better safety net within the existing uh, system and more about what type of institutions could you create which would embed um, a voice for claimants and a role for trade unions within the uh, structures of the welfare state. It seems to me and uh, David Edrington talked about this at the beginning about uh, institutions and I think in his book he talks about the importance of institutional power and relates that to the role of trade unions and so even though where in countries where trade union membership has declined coverage of industries has declined those who have uh, a role in the administration and delivery of uh, social insurance provision are much more embedded as social partners in a regular dialogue with the government and have a much stronger bargaining position and influence over the social security system uh, in those countries. And so I think what I find interesting in there is the extent to which this doesn't seem to have been a focus for trade unions in this country. The Labour Party has tended not to give it very much consideration. Um, there were, as has been mentioned, brief experiments with this in the sort of the 19. Uh, the late 1970s with the development of the Manpower Services Commission, um, which I think had an interesting and influence on the policies enacted by the Thatcher government in the early 1980s. Um, some of those active labour market programmes then were arguably much more progressive than many of the programmes uh, we have since seen in terms of uh, levels of conditionality applied to participation. Uh, they were voluntary. Uh, the levels of income people receive for participation, things like the community program, you know, you were paid wage rates, trade union wage rates. Uh, I'm not suggesting these were all singing or dancing bells and whistles programs, but they were nonetheless far more preferable to spending or perhaps being sanctioned uh, if you didn't participate in a two week work trial in Poundland. Um, so I think one of the questions for me here is how my, I guess, probably organizations like the Labour Party, the trade unions, um, perhaps the Scottish government, think about creating institutions that are capable of embedding uh, that kind of user power uh, and social actor power within the delivery of uh, the welfare state. I think uh, you talked, David, about um, in Denmark with the union insurance funds, uh, the role of uh, unions in the delivery of the insurance system, the role of unions in a job rotation program where people who are employed in relatively high school jobs uh, are able to indicate their desire to move back into training and that opens then positions for unemployed people to enter those uh, places of work and participate and learn uh, new skills there. And these seems to me quite interesting ideas about um, developing both more progressive policies and a greater role for unions and social movements within the welfare state. Um, one of the issues I think that's quite interesting uh, in the recent kind of discussions around the kind of post-COVID social security system, and I think this has been uh, made quite well by uh, my colleague here, Rod Hick, is the relative absence of discussion on what are now termed legacy benefits, particularly uh, job seekers allowance, the contributions-based job seekers allowance system, and the extent to which 
these really seem to be undergoing a process of displacement. So if we go back to 1980, we had earnings related supplements to social security, uh, to uh, unemployment benefit. We've now got to a position where the contributions based benefit JSA uh, is 20 pounds less per week than universal credit. It seems to me we're very much being driven to a situation where social security becomes almost entirely uh, means tested rather than having any sense of uh, social insurance and contributions based. I don't think this is accidental. Um, as with much else that has gone, this does appear to be a intentional uh, class project in the sense that, as uh, David Webster indicated, the weaker the social insurance based system becomes, the less support it tends to attract from people on middle to higher incomes who see little uh, point in the social security system. And in which case, the notion that social security is something that they have and we don't uh, actually almost becomes self-fulfilling and self-creating. Um, so for me, I guess that poses the question, having sometimes been a somewhat skeptic of social insurance as to whether the trade unions have historically been right in this correct, uh, in this aspect, and that there is a case here for renewing social insurance as the cornerstone of the social security system. Uh, this is perhaps less fashionable than discussions about universal basic income, of which I'm somewhat sympathetic to. Um, but it does seem to me that social insurance is something that seems to garner public support. They can People can grab onto the notion of reciprocity quite readily, uh, but it also opens up the potential for trade unions to become involved again with the administration uh, of social security. And perhaps in this way would rely less upon uh, getting a Labour government elected uh, every four or five five years. And um, I'm conscious of time, so I will uh, finish up here with just a few questions, really. Um, it's also, this has also encouraged me to start thinking about whether trade unions themselves should be thinking about developing their own forms of mutual support and uh, mutual forms of welfare, and maybe whether this is something academics should increasingly pay greater attention to the potential of, uh, rather than necessarily relying upon state services. Um, and moving on to uh, David Webster's fascinating discussion of uh, the changing nature of conditionality in the system, one of the issues I, I did want to ask was around the um, types of people who are being sanctioned. Are we looking primarily at uh, young people? Are they male? Are they women? Um, is it uh, disabled claimants we know who are perhaps claiming JSA or universal credit. And I wondered if we had any data uh, around those areas. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Those are my ruminations. Thanks very much, Jay. And thanks again, Polly. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A now, and that'll involve all of you. So both the Davids, Polly and Jay. So you can keep your, um, your faces on the screen, please. Um, we've got some questions that have been coming through. Um, I think Sarah's going to curate them somehow and get them to me. Um, so I'm going to uh, abuse or use, I don't know, my chairing responsibility to ask some questions uh, of some people here. Um, and really it's going back to the, the um, all of you have touched on this regarding the winners and losers, which is a sort of theme of the webinar. And um, so I kind of want to ask a question about women. Are, are women are winners or are they losers in this whole system? And this comes from a report uh, by the Institute of Employment Studies, um, a very recent one that has noted, uh, as many of us know, that there's been nearly half a million more people uh, in, un in unemployment since the crisis started, and another half a million who are still in their jobs but not being paid. And of those, uh, it's estimated that most are part-time workers and most are women. Um, so the question here is, uh, have do you see in the work you've been doing um, the how crises, the previous ones, the ones that underpin the current one, have, sh have affected women? And I think this is a question that does link to unions and historically our role of unions in policy making, whether they adequately reflect women's work and women's jobs. So a, a question about women to the panel, and maybe I'll start with uh, anyone who wants it first. I might start with Polly, see if there's anything that's come through the Trussell Trust um, about women and uh, destitution, perhaps. Um, so, 
uh, I mean, there's no doubt women are disproportionately affected by uh, <laughs> multiple different structural inequalities in our system. Um, and we've seen, that's why we've seen women hit hardest um, in terms of losing their employment um, through the COVID pandemic. In terms of people we see at our food banks, we see, we've seen a growing number of, of uh, single parent families, which are more often headed up by women. Um, and we've seen a real spike in the number of food parcels that we've been giving out um, to support children. So there's a, a, a link there to definitely to, to women. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that because most of the people that we have usually seen over the last 10 years at food banks are coming to us because they're destitute, there's a high proportion of single men that we're seeing. Um, and this isn't, and I think this, this is because while there have been a, few, a number of different initiatives in Scotland, where I'm more familiar with, with the different policies to target particular groups of people, often they haven't targeted single men. Single men have been um, sort of excluded from that support. And of course, you know, when universal credit was rolled out and rolled out first in, in uh, Scotland, many of the people who were first put on universal credit were single men because they were, um, you know, not, not um, did have much less complex kind of situations. So, um, so while I think women definitely have and are um, much more affected by structural inequalities than men, actually food bank use it's a slightly different, slightly different picture. And I think that, that it means quite often I find myself in policy discussions with Scottish government officials where, you know, we're definitely talking about what's happening to uh, families, often headed up by women, but we don't want to forget some of these other, other groups as well um, in, in, in the mix. The other thing I just wanted to touch on in terms of trade union, um, sort of trade union's ability to respond to um, women's needs and represent women properly. Uh, as a trade union activist, all of my working life, um, as I'm sure all of you on this call are too, um, I would I would say that what we haven't really discussed in a lot of detail is how much the the um, role of trade unions has massively changed over the last 40 years in terms of membership density, particular sectors of work. And so for me, what the, the, the single most thing I would really like to see trade unions able to do, and it's not just in their gift, it's, it's dependent on governments and all kinds of other spaces of power, is around um, securing better collective bargaining in sectors which are most dominated by women workers, care being the obvious one. So um, that I think is is where I think there's um, much more room for both trade union trade unions to secure um, better terms and conditions that will most affect women and um, uh, employment more generally improving employment conditions for women. Thank you, um, David Etherington. Can I bring you in on this one? Yeah, I've just noted Paul's speaker's comments about unions opposing uh, minimum wage and. Uh, in the 1990s, the person minimum wage. Uh, well, that's a long debate, but I think uh, I, th I think when we're talking about um, the role of trade unions, uh, I mean, I was at a meeting yesterday, uh, Unite Community, on the um, Michael Orton, you know, the Social Security Commission's uh, work about actually completely revamping the Welfare Commission, and the Unite the Unite Trade Union have put a huge amount of work in. I think social policy people, sorry, this is probably a bit controversial, gaslight the trade unions in their analysis. I gaslight in the meaning, no, tend to ignore them. Um, what I found in my research, I mean, I'm, you know, I've, I, as I said in my presentation, I mean, uh, I'm one of the first critiques of the trade unions. I mean, in terms of insecure work, they've got a huge amount of work to do to adapt themselves, to de-bureaucratize, to adapt themselves to the changing labour market, the changing needs of workers, uh, as Polly says. But there are initiatives. I mean, trade unions have LGBTQ, uh, disability, women sections, talking of women. Um, that the strongest uh, the, the densities are in the public sector. So uh, direct or indirectly, they benefit claimants by unions opposing privatisation. Um, PCS have run a long campaign 
against privatisation of the employment services. They've also been involved in a campaign to, with Unite Community and Deepak to, uh, against the job set closures of job centres. The GMB TUC have initiative uh, on, on uh, reasonable adjustments, which is uh, for disabled workers. Uh, it's called the Disability Passport Schemes. There's a whole, uh, the TUC in 2011 had a uh, an anti-austerity strategy around for disabled people. There's disabled members in the trade unions. It, it, it's going on. It's a matter of actually, uh, in terms of research, we need to kind of research what's going on a bit more. Uh, I mean, I scratched the surface in my book and, you know, probably not even did that. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I do think there's conservative elements in the in the trade unions that they, they, they do need to change and, and adapt, which I allude, allude to in my in, in my book about actually, uh, well, there's a huge, they've got huge challenges, you know, to make them more relevant. Um, and they are, and there are initiatives in doing that. There's uh, the, the learning from Norwegian unions about actually uh, standing outside workplaces and they work, the Sports Direct, which got into the Parliament. Uh, you think that's a Guardian expose? Well, actually, it was from Unite Community. Uh, the trade union is stood outside um, the, uh, the warehouse talking to workers about um, their conditions. And it was through Unite Community where we got that sort of public, in well, sort of came into the public arena and the, and, and the committee. So, so let's credit, let's give them credit to what they do. But I do think there are huge amounts of challenges. Uh, just finally on women, um, I think it's I think the women's budget group have done a huge amount of work. They have they've got special COVID, um, uh, they've got a special COVID sort of uh, information service, and uh, austerity has disproportionately impacted on women. And I don't think there's there's been enough. To talk about that and then that needs I do agree that needs analyzing more. Thank you um we're running well we've got about 10 minutes left so I'm going to pick some questions that have come through the um I don't know what you call this the zoom chat group chat uh so we will start with Katie Jones I think has one sorry I'm very uh my computer's very slow with this here we go uh so Katie Jones, who works at Manchester Met in the Decent Work Unit, uh, she's asking, are the panellists encouraged by the government's wider good work agenda? And how could this help to shift the emphasis from work first to work quality? And I'd echo that in Scotland, there's a similar kind of rhetoric around fair work and good work that's been going on through the Scottish government. So the question is, is this encouraging? Is this doing enough, I suppose? Um, I'm going to throw this at Jay, I think. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I'd like to think so. Um, but given historical experience, I, I'm not convinced it will lead to the substitution of a, a kind of a work first approach with a focus on decent work. I know that's a, a key concern along with uh, kind of the discourse around inclusive growth. We obviously had uh, prior to the current government the uh, Theresa May's inspired Taylor review. Um, but I don't really see any action that's going into creating the conditions that are conducive for the development of decent work, um, more high quality work, if you want to talk about it in those fashions. Um, I guess this could change uh, following Britain's exit from the European Union, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure why, but that may be feasible. Um, but yeah, not really. I don't see any evidence that they're making any real changes. They seem to have no desire to shift on social security. We can see that in the resistance to any change in universal credit. They were reluctant to roll out the job retention scheme initially. Uh, Rishi Sunak, you know, was kind of talking in March, at the beginning of March, um, that he'd done enough and didn't really need to go down that road. They were talking about keeping conditionality. 
into the teeth of the COVID pandemic. And it was only became it, when it became quite clear that that was nonsensical that they rode back from that. Obviously, there have been um, slight changes of emphasis since then, but the broad system remains in place. For me, it looks like they're simply trying to get everything back on the road. Um, and you can maintain a discourse of, of decent work and quality work while doing very little to transform the political economy of your uh, nation state in ways that would support it. And I don't see any evidence that the British government uh, has any indication of transforming its reliance upon its broad liberal political economy. Thank you. Um, we have a question that was submitted in advance, which was a spatial question. So about regional and place-based inequalities. Um, I don't know if this is spurred on by Andy Burnham or not, but it's about whether um, we need to reconsider the level at which we're defining uh, benefits and the relationship between work and welfare. Um, and I wonder whether um, we could start with David Webster thinking about whether there are um, in the sanctions data any connections with different localities um, or any kind of trends that have come through the sanctions work regarding um, varying conditionality in different labour markets? Is that anything? Is there anything there? Oh, you're on mute, David Webster. This is a question that often comes up and uh, everybody who's done work on it has found that the system is very much a standard national system and there aren't really any consistent variations between areas. I mean, the only exception is that um, sometimes labour market conditions automatically affect the level of sanctions. So the obvious example is if you set a rule that, for instance, people will be referred to the work programme after they've employed, been employed for 12 months, that automatically means that there will be more people in high unemployment areas who are sanctioned for not going on their work programme uh, assignment. Um, that's because the higher the level of unemployment, the longer people will be unemployed. So in areas of high unemployment, you have a higher proportion of long-term unemployed people, so you will have more sanctions for not going on a program which is related to how long you've been unemployed. But really the DWP throughout this escalation of sanctions since 2010 appears to have maintained very, very tight managerial control over the level of sanction. So they wanted to, to start with up to 2013, they wanted to push it up and it went up everywhere. And then after 2013, they wanted to push it down. So it went down everywhere. And no, there is, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, they adapt the system according to local labor market characteristics. Thank you. <laughs> a pretty full answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've only a few minutes left. So I'm gonna ask the same question to everybody on the panel. So if you can give a couple of sentences as a response, um, and this has come via Sarah Weekly. So if we want trade unions, governments and political parties to embed social acts of power in the welfare state, what are some of the best first moves? So in short, what could be the next steps to making things better? Um, and we'll start with David Etherington, and then we'll go David Webster, then Polly, and then Jay, if that's okay. Well, actually just, Linking to the last question also about uh, well, localization and devolution. Uh, one of the things I found, well, I've written about it in the book on Greater Manchester, but uh, Martin Jones and I did some work <coughs> in Greater Manchester and, and, the Sheff uh, and the Sheffield city regions. And what we found again, that there was no, no attempt by the devolved authorities to include the trade unions and um, and we interviewed the trade unions and um, you know basically I think this is kind of embedded in the political culture of anti anti trade unionism even amongst some of the Labour Party members but I think um, getting you know a good start uh, would be to get more greater social dialogue and involvement with the trade unions I know there's memorandums agreements in Greater Manchester around health. Uh, but but there are reports 
from the TUC say, saying that the LEPs, log, log enterprise partnerships, could have more trade union involvement. So that that's a start. Uh, and the the other thing about um, uh, also benefits is that this could also bring um, more progressive and trade union and community influence in relation to the the design of um, adaptation or design of uh, benefit systems within localities. Um, anyway, I'll say I won't say more than that. Thank you. Uh, David Webster, do you want to go next? Well, I also would would put the emphasis on trade unions. We have this ridiculously low level of un unionization among people who are in in the gig economy and the marginal types of employment. Um, and the, I think the main reason for that is organizing trade unions for those workers is much more difficult. Um, it's something which some of the unions have uh, taken on board, like Unite uh, has done quite a lot of work in this area. And also there are some uh, spontaneous spontaneous growths of, of unions in some of these marginal areas. But basically, I would have thought we need a, a more coordinated push across the trade union movement to get uh, these kinds of workers organised. Thank you. Holly? What an impossible question. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, oh, God, there's so many moves. I think I agree with what has already been said, um, but I think what I'm really interested in, and it's come out on this call, is a lack of, um, you know, there's a wariness and a caution about engaging with the trade union, with trade unions and the trade union movement from um, other, other, other actors, whether that's academics or um, third sector groups. And um, I spent my whole working life working on the kind of boundaries between the two different groups. Um, and it hasn't got any better. I think this, you know, there's a there's, there's a deep lack of understanding. So I think my my first move would be um, to see some closer working. For example, I'm very keen that the Trussell Trust starts doing some work with the Scottish Trade Union Congress and trade unions in Scotland to look at what we can do together at, on precarious work, measuring what's going on, uh, what the effects are in, in the food bank network and what kind of actions we could take together that might um, protect people more. Because as Jay mentioned before, there are lots of warm words as a fair work convention. Um, as far as, you know, if you've got a zero hours contract, none of that's made any difference whatsoever. We need some teeth on that. So I think the, net, the, the important first move is um, trade unions and other organisations starting to discuss afresh where we've got common common interests and common uh, campaigns on, on social security and the welfare state. Thank you, great. Uh, and finally, Jay? Um, yeah, I guess I'd um, echo what people have already said, really. I'd like to see a uh, modernised version of the Manpower Services Commission called something else, not Manpower, um, but where there's space for uh, trade unions and other civil society organisations to be able to uh, take responsibility and authority over the development and shaping of um, employment programmes and perhaps also input into social security policy, perhaps in um, connection with uh, local authorities. I think we need more channels through which people can bring democratic pressure to bear upon um, politicians. At the moment, the UK's uh, system of social security is relatively centralized, albeit with some devolution of power and authority to uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. I think if we want to potentially be able to influence uh, politicians more directly, then you need direct mechanisms to do so. And one of that is, uh, I guess, elections. Um, and so localization might provide a route to that. And obviously sort of some form of tripartite system or system involving various different social partners also embedded within the system does create scope for institutional power. Um, and that does seem to be a mechanism which through people who might otherwise be excluded, might be able to bring power to bear upon actors uh, who otherwise seem quite remote. So that'd be my view. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks to all the 